The story begins with the protagonist reading a romance fantasy novel, and she is having continuous mind-boggling arguments with herself as the protagonist is leaving her handsome dad and older brother to escape from her privileged life. Not only that but also, it seems that the protagonist ended up receiving a diamond mine. For the day and at that moment, she notices that she has ended up coming in the middle of the street while reading the novel. While she is walking in, a truck runs up straight into her and becomes the reason for ending her life which feels like a joke to her. As the ironic situation continues to unravel itself, the truck that ended up hitting her is the one that makes people reincarnate, and the gods have seemingly made a world based on a romance fantasy novel for her. But it seems that the protagonist doesn't have any wishes to live in a romance fantasy life and she insists that she wants to reincarnate into the romance fantasy story where the handsome dad and older brother from the privileged life are together while having super awesome powers as well. God decides that he will make it as how she truly wants and both of them continue to high-five each other in excitement. At that same moment, a black fog starts appearing claiming that the contract has been made which makes the protagonist wonder if gods even make contracts in the first place. It seems to be the devil in front of her and as she begins saying that she needs to cancel the contract, someone suggests to her that she doesn't need to worry as she is his very last word. In the end, the protagonist ends up reincarnating in a dreamy world where she continues to mop the floor which makes her call the people behind the reincarnation frauds. It seems that her life doesn't have a handsome brother or dad, no privileged life, and no powers at the same time. All she has is an uncle who cannot stand her for even a second and a cousin named Claddy who is beloved by her uncle, unlike her. Also, the dad she ended up meeting is always mad at her as if something is wrong with her. He believes that the protagonist cannot be his daughter at any cost. She begs her father to take her away, but she ends up suffering on Duke Piraten's estate. Even though the bloodline is talented with magic, she doesn't have any kind of magical power making her feel like the man in front of her isn't her father in the first place. She realizes that she doesn't really have magical powers to be the duke's daughter and they do not even look similar from any angles. But it seems that she has a hidden ability named Russian Cash as she can be creating the romance novel she was reading with the ability. She starts jumping in excitement believing that she will be able to create the things that she loved once again. But life isn't that easy as she will be needing to complete quests to earn the cash and the tasks are weirder than ever as the task is calling her to kiss the cheek of her father. When she learns that the majestic being will be taking away her life, she ends up kissing on the duke's cheek while fearing for her life, thinking that her father will be the one finishing her off this time. She ends up gaining 1000 cash as a reward and is supposed to draw tickets for that which begins to fill her life with various men trying to take care of her and some despise her making her wonder if she will be able to enjoy her delightful, reincarnated life. As the protagonist continues to brush the floor, she demands to know where are the things she demanded to have and thinks that she must have no need to reincarnate back. Then, but as she gets on with leaving her work for a second, she gets called lazy, just like her mother and even gets beaten at the same time while her bucket gets kicked in. The perpetrator of the incident is none other than her uncle who cannot stand her even for a second and he angrily demands her not to be pretending to be his niece. He insists that she will be calling him Marquis, claiming that her behavior is the only reason why her father ended up abandoning her in the first place. Instead of backing up, he insists that she must not even be the real daughter of the duke which makes the protagonist regret being born in this strange world. The moment she was reborn, she saw the gorgeous and beautiful house making her realize that she was born into a good family. But survival wasn't the biggest issue in this life feeling like a dream there was love to receive hoping that she will be getting an ending like the heroines usually do in the novels. She was quite excited but it was all trashed. Soon her cousin Clady comes in calling her father, making her realize that she must be the one who is going to be the heroine in this world. The protagonist realizes that she isn't the one who is about to become the main character in this world for sure. When her uncle calls in his child, Clayt demands that there is no way he should be bullying a child like the protagonist while making an angry face. The Marquis insists that she must be a good girl as she is always worried about the children, as it is her birthday soon, and the Marquis claims that the birthday is the reason why she asked the protagonist to get it cleaned in the first place. Even when Clayty insists that the birthday doesn't have to be spent in the big hall, he demands that he cannot be showing minimal effort on her birthday for sure. Then to mock the protagonist even more, Clady goes on to hold her mouth in front of her to order her to relax. She goes on to create a drama by saying that her shoes are quite soaked, 
and the Macaries insists that he will be buying her new shoes, making the protagonist recall her terrible fate which she never wanted in the first place. She continues to clean the floor as quickly as possible and goes on to sleep at night trembling and hurting. It seems that as she failed to clean the hall properly, the uncle claimed that she will be having no dinner from the day. After as she will have to survive on one meal a day. While she is having the worst night of her whole life, she reminisces recalling Clady saying that it will be unfair to other people if she ends up getting her free meals. As her father said, the people who don't work shouldn't be eating at all as the protagonist. Continues to look at Clady saying the words without even thinking for once. As she remembers how Clady demanded her to work more and more. Her uncle's face started appearing in front of her saying that she should be thanking him, as her father left and irresponsibly refused to provide money for her, so he doesn't want to take care of her as well. Everyone just brags talking about the cost of her food, saying does she even know how much she eats in the first place. Her uncle also added that he wanted to test if she can really be her father's daughter, as she cannot even use dark energy, meaning that she has finally been abandoned by everyone. She realizes that the evil granting the contract took away a father and a brother and also the family that she always wanted, making her think that she can be having it. Even though her life is unfair, she thinks that she cannot be weak, making her mind say that she cannot just die like that as she needs to survive in the zero-point world. Then Clady's birthday surely comes soon and people continue to praise her for being so beautiful and gorgeous at such an age. Everyone discusses how much the Marquis loves his daughter so much that he decided to give her an expensive birthday dress that she wore on the birthday, as if the dress costs as the price of the mansion. While people continue to talk about luxurious dresses and money, the protagonist stands away from them watching what they are doing. As she enters the hallway, something falls down on the ground from Clady and she starts demanding the protagonist to wipe from the floor. She realizes that none of the maids care what she is doing as they are already ordered by the Marquis and seeing her not working gets the Marquis worked up once. Again, the protagonist starts wiping Clady's shoes while crying, fearing that she will be whipped once again, reminiscing to ask herself if her memory was wrong from the beginning. But at that moment, the duke enters the room, claiming that his daughter isn't blonde carrying a lovely aura around her. The uncle gets scared and frustrated after seeing Duke Ferratin all of a sudden, and the protagonist is kind of surprised to see such a human with hair combined with a darkness deeper than the abyss. Not only that but also, he has eyes redder than pure pigeon blood as if his details are surely described in a novel. It seems that she now realizes why the duke decided to leave her as nothing between them really matches truly. When the duke continues to enter the room, both of them start to bicker as if something has gone wrong. The duke gets mad at the Marquis for almost calling him too idle, and the Marquis is quite surprised and nervous that the duke ended up coming too soon without making any contact with him. All of a sudden, he notices the protagonist sitting down on the ground which makes him ask what is wrong with her as she is looking at him weirdly like a rat. The Marquis claims that she is working at the house as a servant and the Duke questions him that it must not be the Princess of Ferratin to make a joke out of it. The protagonist realizes that he wouldn't be happy to know that she is his daughter for sure if he can be acting like that. But even after that, she ends up gathering the courage to ask the Duke if he can take her with him, adding the fact that because of not bathing for a long time she looks such way as she isn't even allowed to take a bath. She adds that she is good at cooking and cleaning so she will be paying for the meal and continues from there, only to end up crying and saying that she just wants to go back home in that instant. Then when he claims that she is full of spirit, she adds that he is her dad, just as the Marquis is to Clady and he is to her. After listening to her for a while, the Duke decides to carry her by holding her dress without speaking anything and warning the maids and butlers to go back. The protagonist is gasping in excitement and shock as she is escaping the palace of the Marquis. While the duke continues to walk in front of the path, he suggests the protagonist close her eyes as he does something that ends up ripping the clothes and makes Clady look like a girl wearing old and rugged clothes. The protagonist realizes that it must have been done by the duke after all and she doesn't understand why the Marquis is standing still even after that. Then after a while, when the protagonist wakes up in the morning, the maid inside her room asks if she had been coughing at night while greeting her. She thinks that she still doesn't get any kind of expression as it has already been 10 days since the duke came to her. Surprisingly, when she stands on the ground, she notices that her feet don't hurt anymore as her health recovered quite quickly. She feels like she is now better than the time when she got sick and even though she doesn't expect the duke to come and see her regularly, she thinks of the day when she confronted him at once. She is feeling like she is in a 
magical world where no one beats her and she doesn't have to starve. She feels like her first task to think of is to figure out what kind of man the Duke truly is. She thinks of the ideas of justice, guardian, and peace but none of them adds up to his character making her feel like she is thinking of some kind of villain in the first place. She thinks that there must be two main villains to defeat and one of them is her uncle, the Marquis, and the next one is the Duke, who doesn't seem like a villain now as if he is on. The number two, the protagonist feels like she is now successful and realizes that none of the things that were spoken by God feels right to her anymore is nothing like that happened. When she thinks of revealing the secret behind the duke, she gets on with paying for her meal as she gets ready to clean the whole palace. When she goes on to clean the house, the maids continue to make her understand that she shouldn't be the one doing these as she is none other than the duke's daughter living inside the palace with him. But the protagonist thinks otherwise, as she thinks that if she is the youngest in the house, gladly accepted, she would have been inside the palace a long time ago. But that didn't happen, as she was surely abandoned by her father. Soon the duke comes in asking what is happening, which makes her wonder why he must be coming in so early. As she continues to clean the house, he couldn't help but wonder who must have told her to do that which makes her remark that she is doing as she promised, she would be paying for her own meal. In that instant, the duke starts carrying by holding her with the clothes once again, making her wonder if she would probably be thrown out in an instant. But instead of throwing her away, she gets seated on a chair in front of the dining table filled with an expensive breakfast. As she seems to be thinking too much before eating the food, the duke starts asking her for an explanation. On the other hand, the protagonist is having a tough time wondering how much she should be eating, as she is already having a hard time. When the duke asks her if she could eat a little more, she feels like he is demanding to finish her off by looking at his face. At that moment, a maid comes in claiming that the protagonist has a smaller stomach compared to the others, and if she ends up eating more, she will be falling sick because of stomach ache. The duke asks for her name and the maid introduces herself as Anna. After hearing her name, the protagonist realizes that even though she had seen her every day, she is getting to know her name for the first time right now. Anna gets told that she will be taking care of her on a regular basis from now on and the protagonist is ecstatic to have her own dedicated maid. She is quite shocked. She now thinks that she might be able to stay here for real. She thinks that her father is only thinking of the noble honor by letting her stay while the truth is really something. Else, while she continues to dwell in her thoughts, the duke asks her once again if she is not able to continue eating for once again. As she claims that she isn't able to eat anymore, both of them continue to sit on the table while looking at each other and she feels that the gaze of her father must be making her feel quite awkward. Then all of a sudden, one of the butlers comes inside of the room, saying that the Imperial Palace has been demanding his rushed return the very same day. The protagonist feels like it is a good turn for her to escape and realizes that his forthcoming must have been unscheduled. Then when he moves on, he suggests the protagonist stay still instead of doing anything stupid, which continues to make her think how many windows she ended up cleaning the same day. Then when she lies down on the bed, she thinks that her life must be difficult but at least she doesn't need to worry about eating and sleeping for instance. Then Anna comes in, announcing that the duke surely doesn't want to abandon her, so she doesn't have to do anything in the house to reflect her proficiency to stay inside of the palace. She suggests that she is still quite young and the only daughter of her father, so she shouldn't be worrying too much and just be happy. She realizes that she must have been looking anxious for her age and the others continue to talk about her as she had been suffering from nightmares and painful wounds. They all suggest something good as she now can talk to them about any of her problems. The protagonist realizes that they were worried about her and Anna thinks that she thought the obvious for nothing at all. Then when she claims that all of them must have been displeased with her, the protagonist reveals that all she thought was that they didn't like her in the beginning which is the only reason she felt awkward in the first place, making the maids gasp in shock. All of them ask her if she would like to talk to them and the maids claim that the youngest lady is quite different from the other young masters, as if she is just a normal kid. She gets to know the name of the maid who is Nancy and the protagonist gets reminded that, as she has already reincarnated in this body, she is no longer an ordinary child, claiming that she likes plain and normal things. The protagonist is happy that she is feeling for the first time the living energy of people, even though it was a little awkward. In the beginning, she doesn't dislike it for sure. At night, she continues to wonder if she can be living in a house called a family, and as she thinks of what Anna said, she thinks that she doesn't have to feel insecure anymore. But she remembers what people used to speak about her, some hatred-filled words about carrying an illegitimate child. 
a mother whom she has never seen before. She finally realizes that there must be no dark energy emitting from her father. It is illustrated that he has black hair and blood-red eyes, along with a face as sharp as a refined sword. Realizing that both of them have no resemblance to each other at all, the protagonist thinks that the Marquis must have been saying the truth after all. She now feels like if the Duke gets to hear that she is an illegitimate child, she will surely get kicked out of the house. Knowing that she needs to be putting so much effort if she needs to keep on living, she knows that if she manages to gain his affection when he raises her, she won't be killed for sure. She believes in her doing well as she is a pro-romance fantasy reader who has read thousands of romance novels. She continues to become more and more optimistic about her situation. Believing that she could do it, she reaches for the room where her father is staying. As she comes in front of the door, the guard makes way for her to get in as her father was calling for her. She thinks of counting to ten before going in and starts to wonder how he must have known that she was approaching him. When she enters the room, she notices that her father is sitting on a cough. Looking straight at her, she runs up to her only to end up hugging his leg recalling that she had been missing him. He claims that he made her feel uncomfortable and she insists that it happened since they didn't meet for a long time, asking that she wants to be with him right now, as they will be sticking with each other. Then the moment she ends up doing a little cute thing by touching his cheeks, something notifies her saying that the conditions are met as she has finally awakened the Russian. Cash Attribute As the attribute awakens, she wonders if she has seen some illusions because she was tired, and the name of Aftanes reveals in front of her, the one who tricked her into having the revival. She realizes that the power that he wanted to grant her must be the Russian cash attribute and it seems that her father ended up hearing her call that he has the face of a baby as his cheeks are quite soft. He ends up making her sit on her lap and starts poking her cheek which feels like the tyrant of a father is starting the process of turning her into a dumb girl. The duke remarks that she looks like an angry pufferfish and she feels like there is no way. Then as the meeting gets ended because of the duke, he spends the whole time carrying the protagonist in his arms and spends the whole day like that. Soon she gets suggested that she will be taking a bath right now, and she realizes that he must have said that because of things that she decided to speak to him about. She thinks of not giving her hopes up and Anna comes in suggesting that she should be having a bath. While bathing, she thinks that compared to the Duke's thoughts, she now has more important things to do as the notification only appears the moment she paid attention to the Duke. As she gets on with accessing the attribute, she notices that the devil is playing a prank on her as she goes on to access it. Then when the attribute reveals itself, she notices that the level of the attribute is F which can be summoning romantic fantasy novels that she read while using the cash. She starts to wonder about the novels that she read before, including the abilities of the female protagonists, which feels mind-blowing to her as she didn't expect it to happen. She thinks that if she can be using all of those abilities, survival wouldn't be a problem. For her as she can even conquer the whole world right now. She thinks of saying goodbye to those humiliating days behind her, having a new mission of proving her worth. She realizes that it is not a time for celebration already right now. She will be needing to get her personality evaluated by the attribute to use it. Also, she will be needing to get it done by her own abilities as the conditions are set. She ends up accepting the mission knowing that she will have to do them anyway. Realizing that objects are extremely rare in romantic fantasy novels, she thinks of summoning the medium of it. Many of the ideas start to roll inside her mind as there are holy artifacts of the temple, magic imbued items, and even heirlooms passed through generations of noble families. She thinks of looking through the heirlooms of the duke's family as it would be great but even if it is there, she thinks that there must be other problems coming along with that. Idea. She knows that there is no way she would be able to say to her father that she needs the heirlooms. She thinks of planning ahead as she will be needing them the moment she wakes up the next day. The next day when she wakes up, the maid comes in asking if she caught a cold once, again and wonders if Anna was the one who tucked her in. But the maid claims that she wasn't the one as they aren't allowed while she is sleeping, which makes her wonder who that person must have been. The moment she stands on the ground, she starts greeting the maids. She ends up pointing to some of the hair clips as they look shiny and sparkling. Even the same color as her eyes, according to the maids. Then when she remarks the expense of the item, the maids suggest that she should not worry about it as she is the only daughter of the duke. She remarks that there must be some room where the duke is storing sparkling things and the maids claim that there are rooms like that. Even so, there are back in the fort at the duke's territory, there are even more of them. The moment she ends up asking them to visit the places, the maids claim that she surely can and continues to have such sad expressions all over her face. So her plan is successful. 
Nancy ends up hugging her in sadness as she is such a small child worrying about these things, and the protagonist pats her back suggesting that she is fine. And the reason behind her well-being is that she has sisters, the maids, worrying about her in the first place. All of the maids rush to her as she thinks of all of them as someone close to her, and she feels like she is experiencing something like this for the first time in her life. Also, now it doesn't even feel that bad. Changes into it feels very pleasant to her. After a while, as it is supposed to be the first time the little miss is about to get into the duke's residence, all of them think of exploring inside the holy sanctuary. The maids claim that compared to the duke, the treasure room of the marquis is nothing special, and as she is the only daughter of the duke, she surely has the permission to enter and exit the place anytime she wants. But the permission must be granted by the duke. She feels that it will be okay as she will have to confirm if there are summoning artifacts among the treasures and she soon gets invited to breakfast by the duke, which feels like a sudden thing to do for her. The protagonist once again feels like she is about to get sick as well but the moment she takes a look at her father's face, she knows that she has to get used to it to some extent. She smilingly thanks her father for the meal and claims that her effort is bringing tears to her own eyes. As she continues to finish her food, the duke notices that she ended up finishing her pudding and offers his plate for her. Even though the protagonist was thinking that he must have been ignoring her, she now realizes that wasn't the case at all and wonders if it would be too much of a task for her to ask him to take a bite. Then instead of dwelling too much on her thoughts, she starts to take one scoop of the pudding only to end up being unsuccessful and gathering the courage. Then when she is in the middle of her own thoughts, looking all puffy and nervous, the duke ends up asking why she isn't sticking to him at all and ends up grabbing her, only to make her embrace him once again. She realizes that he was waiting for her on purpose, and thinks that he must have been planning to say something to her, instead of doing Anything, he ends up making her sit on his lap only to start working on his things, which feels a bit off to the protagonist as the plans didn't go as she wished. She starts to feel a little bit embarrassed and realizing that it must be such bad timing. She thinks of finding the mediator. The duke realizes her situation and asks what must be wrong with her, as she decides to answer it by saying that she wants to look at some pretty things for instance. Anna instantly comes into the room asking that the protagonist wanted to look around the shrine room for the day which feels like a bad situation for her. But instead of saying anything to her, the duke starts walking in the direction of the shrine room, while his documents are all scattered around the room. She starts to wonder if the duke is surely a good villain. When they enter the shrine room, she notices that there aren't just treasures inside, but also the spoils of war as well. Suddenly she notices a special book on one of the places and ends up asking the duke about it. It seems that the book is a sealed one, and it starts to make her wonder what must be. Inside of it, one of the butlers claims that there is nothing sealed inside of the book right now to ensure her feelings. When she asks about the book's place in the treasure room, the man claims that it is the only thing that the founding duke treasured the most which feels quite old and fascinating to the protagonist. When she ends up asking if she can touch the book, the duke doesn't listen to her, remarking the butler to claim that he had to refuse because of the preservation state of the book. As she begins to think of some last resort, the unknown quest ends up appearing in front of her as the tasks have the consequences of losing her life if she ends up failing. While she is worried out of her mind as she thinks that she is about to die, the hints begin to show up and she notices that the duke's face has a heart marked on his cheek, which starts to unravel inside her mind. She dwells her mind further into wondering why the heart-shaped mark must have been drawing on his face and soon she realizes that she doesn't have much time to waste on the mark. Realizing that the heart appearing must mean something obvious, she thinks of kissing his face. But she is worrying that what will happen if he ends up remarking that she looks like a strangled frog or something even more obscene. Somehow, she thinks of calming down to wonder what if the hint isn't even related to a kiss in the first place. She thinks of just convincing him at any cost and starts doing so, calling the duke her daddy, asking if she can touch it just once when he gets it out. She insists saying that she is feeling bad that no one got to read the book for a hundred of years as she thinks of petting the book carefully, so it doesn't hurt, while revealing her puppy eyes in front of him. The moment she ends up feeling his hand moving, she fears if he is about to crush her to death or not for not listening to him. Even so, she notices that more of the hints are now appearing for her calling her to kiss his face. Understanding that it must be her only way to deal with the situation, she takes her hand to approach him proclaiming that she will give up persuading him, no matter what happens. When she asks for him, he doesn't know what is about to happen thinking that it will be better for him if he doesn't know what she is going to do. She gets close to her father and gets up close to his shoulder thinking that she will make it, and she ends up placing a kiss on his face at that moment. 
The Duke is quite shocked and embarrassed for not realizing what was about to happen and all of the guards around him are quite shocked wondering how it could even be possible in the first place. The protagonist notices that the Duke's expressions are quite handsome, and while she was expecting for him to say something, she hears the sound of some crumbling and breaking of glasses near them. It seems that the Duke has broken off the glasses that were sealed in the book, and he is now fulfilling her wish to get the book close to her as she wanted to touch it for once. Even the butlers continue to shriek in fear and exhaustion and the Duke and the protagonist continue to play their way which gets the protagonist somehow annoyed. Maybe. The Duke remarks that there is nothing wrong with the book as even if it may be a sealed book, as there is nothing sealed in it for the moment, so he doesn't know what kind of residue there might be inside of it. She realizes that he is quite worried about her, and which is why he was shaking the book to see through it if there will be any danger from her holding it. At that moment, she realizes it finally that this whole time, the Duke was thinking of the protagonist being in danger rather than thinking of the matter that she will somehow damage the book. The butler in shock claims that the book is a heirloom that was followed along with the history, along with the founding duke's most valuable treasure, and starts talking about what will happen if there is something kind of accident happening with it. But instead of dwelling on it, the duke with a cornering look on his face recalls the butler asking if the book is his which gets him in such a sticky situation. Then when the protagonist gets to touch the book, she claims that her father is the best which shocks in a way or two. As the whole endeavor finishes, she kisses him once again on the cheek realizing that he must be a typical fool for his daughter's love. Even so, she thinks that he must have gotten harder by the look on his face, and she ends up obtaining the mediator summons for completing the mission of proving her worth. She also received a reward of 500 cash as a reward while the reward of 5,000 cash draw tickets slid in. It doesn't just stop there, Viscount Urkel Duke Parathon's chief aide is moved by her including a lot of things that gained respect accumulating for her, leading to more cash. For her, it seems that she was able to draw the highest satisfaction of the duke and as her father starts speaking with her once again, she thinks of checking out the rewards later. As they sit closely once again in his room, she just wants to go into her room to check the rewards and the people around them continue to talk about the matter of him keeping close eyes on Marui's Talinka. The Duke realizes that everyone sitting in the big positions has been making their moves, while the information on the Parathon Duchy's investment status in the Mana Stone mining business might be looking suspicious. His men no doubt that even though Marquis Cherodal was actively partying and enjoying his time, Duke Delbarton and Uskamil have both been quiet as none of them have contacted each other. While the Duke keeps on thinking the same as what the protagonist was thinking, she ends up saying out loud that the Marquis Talenkia directly conversed with them, which sets silence in the whole room. The protagonist starts to stutter after realizing that the people in front of her must have listened to what she intended to say. The Duke is also surprised that she ended up referring to Marquis Talenka, and to divert his attention, the protagonist claims that, according to her uncle, saying that he was the one who talked about the duke investing in it. She knows that the people might think that it would be weird for her to come up with it. Just now, as she reminisces how her uncle presented a very pretty card as evidence, then she points toward the card sitting on the table, which seems to be the issuer of Parathon Duchy. As soon as the people in front of them get the truth revealed in front of them, they start to react sensing that the Marquis might have dared more than what he should have done, calling the issuer as investment evidence. They surely know that even though it wouldn't matter if mana stones really come out of the vein, it will be causing a huge issue for them if it doesn't. The duke senses that the word would be spreading like wildfire, implying that the Parathon duchy engaged in such a fraud in the first place. As he finishes his sentence, the protagonist notices that her father had been looking at her the whole time, and he begins asking her where she heard something like that from. Knowing that she is being doubted by her father, she reveals that when the man was meeting the Marquis, she had been polishing his shoes. She feels like she would be the one facing death if her father ends up suspecting her. She stutteringly completes whatever she had to say to come clean in front of the Duke. The men present around the room claim that the checks issued by the Parathon to Maruis in recent years have all the support covered for the protagonist. And after hearing that, she tries her best to make them believe that it is far from the truth. Trying to make her point, she tries to make them understand the truth behind her words. But all the men know is that the Duke had been sending a huge amount of money each month to the Marquis to take care of her. She insists that the Marquis continued to claim that he didn't have money. She even adds that she worked hard to do the dishes, cleaning, and everything, according to the instructions given by her uncle, 
reflecting why the Marquis ended up getting her a place to sleep and feed her. None of the men could believe what she was saying as nobody would dare to do such things to a child. Even though the Marquis himself is famous all around the continent for being a fool for his daughter, sensing that the crowd is being nonsensical about her claims, she remarks on what the Marquis always claimed about him being left with no money to take care of the protagonist. As she insists that she felt like being abandoned, she waited to hear what they wanted to say as if they had been doubting her all this time. Even after not being believed, she adds how she could only do a small amount of work to provide two meals a day, and not only that but also, most of the time she would only have to live with eating nothing in a whole day. As the whole crowd gasps in front of her being unable to believe how the Marquis could do something to her, she thinks to herself how hard she had been trying to survive this whole time. The moment she brings the topic of discussing the matter of investment to another old man having red hair, the Duke claims that it is enough already. When the Duke starts to agonize questioning the audience in front of him, the protagonist finally realizes that the Duke wasn't questioning her this whole time. The Duke finally remarks that they shouldn't even dare to question his child, and as the whole crowd in front of them starts to have tough time breathing, the Duke stands up, worrying about his daughter, feeling that her father is straying further away from her. She grabs his hand immediately only to be taken on his hand once again. The Duke calls in his assistant demanding that they need to call a tailor as soon as possible for his daughter. Later the protagonist can be seen lying down on a bed wondering how she ended up falling asleep all of a sudden while she was sitting in the duke's office some time ago. Realizing that Anna must have brought her into her room, she notices that the maids cannot be seen around the room, sensing that it must be an opportunity for her to read the shared history alongside the Parathen duchy. Fearing that the pages will be worn out, she ends up opening the book anyways, remarking that she needs to sort her stuff quickly. The moment she opens the book, the whole room starts to shine with various bubbles around her, and the moment she touches even one of them, the book transforms into a dreamy historical book, removing the old look of it immediately. Excitedly, she opens up the book to find out that there is forbidden magic, methods to borrow a god's power, and some other important things detailed in it. Feeling suspicious of demons summoning because of the book, she decides to take a first look which reveals a huge blank book consisting of the details of Mediator Summon, Rush, and Cash at the same time. The protagonist notices that the revoking items have been sealed as the restriction to use Rush and Cash attributes has been lifted for her. Even though she can now use her ability, new missions have already been decided for her, realizing that it must have been the mission she needed. She looks focused on the matter than ever. She thinks of going with the flow and begins trying to summon her ability but realizes that nothing has been summoned for her, making her realize that she must need something else to do to make it happen. At that moment, she begins to summon someone endowed with the cold bloodline, wondering if the person can show up right in front of her now to get her the chance to use all his strength to defeat her enemies. But her ability doesn't work once again, making her embarrassed of the situation. She doesn't think of losing her hope and makes up her mind to escape from death by using the gold coins that she has reserved for her. The system rejects her stating that she is surely short of cash memory and disappointed of the situation. The protagonist sees some hope as the system reveals that she has a chance to win 5,000 data units. Thinking of getting a shot at the winning chance, she notices that she has a successful attempt and ends up becoming successful, even though she was thinking that she might be losing to the fraud evil god once again. But no, she is right once again. She wins 100 data units instead of 5,000, feeling that history is repeating itself by making her greedy. Noticing that she barely has any coins to summon any romance novel, she decides to check up on the unopened messages inside her inventory. In the end, she realizes that the cache memory stuff is way harder than she had expected, so she decides to keep the memory cache for a rainy day first. Suddenly, Anna walks into her room apologizing for being absent at the time she woke up and reveals that everyone was surprised to see that she was sleeping on the duke's lap all of a sudden. She couldn't help but wonder how anything that Anna said could have been the truth, and she even reveals that everyone was scolded because they couldn't stop laughing after seeing her sleepy state. Not only that but also, the duke was the one who carried her inside instead of the maids. Feeling that the duke might be annoyed by her helpless state, Anna elaborates that the duke must be thinking quite the opposite. She even adds that the Duke had called the tailor for her new clothes, proclaiming that he surely loves her so much. 
the protagonist realizes that she was thinking of the duke in the opposite way while he was just an ordinary person like the others. And it even adds that the way the duke treats the protagonist is extraordinary as no one has ever received the same treatment from him in their life. Even though the maids think of, as someone special, the protagonist is continuing to have a hard time realizing why all of them have such high expectations of him. She ends up agreeing with them as they were all speaking from experiences, assuming that she will be learning more about him. Anyways, meanwhile, the Marquis realizes that he is about to hit a pit stop once again, as his last customer star condemned that the transaction request that Galleon back has been rejected. He despises the Duke so much that because of him, he was never able to become that successful as all of his preparations get stranded in the ruins all the time. He senses that there might be some chances as the Duke Parathon must have found out that he lied about the investment from the beginning. Fearing that if the news ends up reaching his father's ears, he commands his assistant not to let the news reach him. Feeling that he has to think of something to save the situation, commanding his men to call Clady in an instant. When Clady comes up to him, he asks if she wants to visit the Duke's residence to meet the protagonist. The moment she learns that she would be meeting her, she starts to react the opposite way, revealing her true face and announcing that she should be the one to visit her instead. After thinking of the fate that the protagonist had, she realizes that she will be needing to take the initiative instead which ends up exciting the Marquis. On the other hand, Clady starts feeling superior all of a sudden thinking that the protagonist must be dumbfounded because of her sudden arrival, while the protagonist feels some itch in her ears as if something is about to happen to her life. The next scene revolves around the protagonist trying to draw something, and when Anna tries to support her art style, it seems that she was looking at the drawing quite wrong the whole time. But for some reason, Anna gets so excited after hearing that she wanted to draw her holding hands with Anna. She proceeds to claim that she will be keeping the art as an heirloom for the rest of her life. While the protagonist thought that the bribe of a drawing wasn't going to work well, she ends up realizing that it worked very well which makes her think that she needs to do the same with the other maids as well. When she approaches the others with her drawing, all of them seem quite obsessed about it which makes her feel like everyone around her must be extremely rational and common sense adult, making her feel scared. Soon Anna approaches her saying that she needs to be attending a glass greenhouse in a mansion. The moment she arrives inside the glass greenhouse, the protagonist finally feels like she is truly living in the world of romance. The excited lady continues to run along with the trails inside of the greenhouse, while Anna continues to chase behind her feeling that she will soon fall down on the ground. Her assumption becomes true, and she ends up falling down, and as she starts crying after falling and hurting herself, the Duke comes in front of her asking what she is even doing. When the Duke gets annoyed by her making mistakes, Anna comes in saying that it is quite normal for the children to fall down, but he still insists that she must be weak. Even so, when she asks for her father to carry her, his demeanor changes in an instant and goes on to help her. The wish of the protagonist wanting to see through the glass greenhouse stays as a wish as the duke notices that she has hurt herself quite badly. As they get home, the duke gets concerned of her state and Anna tries her best to make him realize that she will be fine. After taking medicine for a few days, when he continues to charge about the matter regarding her strength, the protagonist starts to wonder if she is truly an illegitimate child which made her father abandon her in the first place. Instead of thinking about it much, the duke starts applying the cream to get her healed which feels quite unnerving and cute to all the maids. The protagonist notices that her father is quite concerned about her, making her realize that she shouldn't be bothering him too much. When the maids call him saying that he needs to attend the meeting as someone came to meet him in the dressing room, he starts walking on his own carrying his daughter as if he is about to attend the meeting with her. When they enter the dressing room, it seems that the duke was thinking of preparing dresses for her, which are supposedly worth more than a castle. None other than Eutra Pelia is present herself to prepare clothing for the lady, and Eutra is the one who started from the bottom and made the emperor's clothing. While Eutra's assistants start talking about the young lady, Eutra thinks that they shouldn't be expecting anything soft from the Parathen duchy, as she has known about the duke for many years. But even though she didn't expect the young lady to be cute, she loses her mind when she takes a look at the protagonist. The cuteness of the protagonist gets her so nervous that Eutra starts to get nosebleeds all of a sudden, feeling that the protagonist must be perfect. When she was about to praise the young lady for her cuteness, Eutra notices the wolf-like glance coming from the duke which gets her to rearrange herself. Even when she is about to take hold of the young lady to measure her, she puts an end to it sensing that the duke wouldn't be allowing that. 
she notices that the protagonist must be loving her father quite so much that she continues to quietly hug him while Yutra keeps on taking the measurements. As the Duke doesn't even want to put her down, Yutra realizes that he must love her quite so much as well, so she doesn't fall down like a newborn once again as she did in the glass greenhouse. Everyone starts praising the young lady and the Duke both at the same time, seeing the great chemistry between them two, making the protagonist feel like they must be eating something wrong. Soon she notices that they are expecting her to make her speak that he is the best father in the world. She does it nervously, and even raises her hand to make an expression while saying so. When the assistants around were expecting the worst fate to face, the protagonist changes the whole picture claiming that she loves her father more than the whole universe. Her implementation feels surprising to the people around her. Not only that but also, the Duke himself claims that he didn't hear enough of what she said, insisting that he wants to hear her once again. As the Duke is flattered by his daughter, others around him continue to praise him for getting so much love from his daughter, which feels quite ironic, and cringes at them as if she could see through them. The meaning behind her love seems to hold quite some meaning to everyone as she wishes to get to know her father even more in the future, planning to stay her whole life with him. Meanwhile, Yutra notices that the dress she brought over is a bit bigger than the lady's size, but she hopes that she will still be able to try them on. Then when she insists that the young lady will be needing to get down from his embrace, he immediately puts an end to her begging, saying that he will be buying all of the dresses so she doesn't have to try them on. He even adds that she can fix all of the dresses according to her size, which makes Yutra realize that she must have earned a fortune in the same place in a single day. But in the end, the Duke sets a condition of making the sleeves just the right size or directs her to cut them short as he doesn't want his daughter to wear clothes that will continue to hide her hands. All of her sayings make her feel like, even though he isn't her real father, he seems to be a good person, fulfilling and taking care of her wishes. On the other hand, Clady has arrived at the Duke's edifice, and she is quite mesmerized to see the place as rumors claim that the edifice of Duke Peraton is very splendid, being higher than even the Dark Tower which is nothing but utter truth. When she enters the mansion, the butler claims that he didn't receive any news that she would be coming over to visit them and starts acting unwelcoming to her. When she asks if she has to obey that much, the steward remarks that she will have to observe the greeting etiquette the next time for sure, as she wouldn't be allowed to enter the edifice the next time. While running inside the edifice, she comes up to the huge picture of the duke and starts wondering how can someone be so perfect hoping to kick out his father from the picture. She thinks that despite the Duke not being her father, nobody would be able to resist her as if she were from this family. He is supposed to adore him like his daughter. She continuously starts to dream that only she will be able to approach him, as if she is the one who can be appeasing his loneliness, hoping that the protagonist will never be able to complete him. Hoping for the worst for the protagonist, she soon enters the room where the protagonist is sitting, dressed up like a doll which makes her wonder why she must have that hair. Color, Clady feels as if she is seeing a whole different person in front of her, not being able to contemplate the person standing in front of her. After seeing Clady, the protagonist starts taking small sips from the teacup, making her wonder if she is the one looking down on her all of a sudden. Clady remarks that the protagonist must be the shameless one, which ends up forcing the lady to open up to her intending to call her an uninvited guest. Clate proudly remarks that the protagonist was the one who was looking forward to seeing her while remarking that she must be the impudent rascal in this whole place. She even makes remarks saying that she isn't the daughter of the duke, adding that her father was the one who said it, reminding her of the worst memories possible. As Clady begins to berate her in the worst way possible, commenting on her behavior, and saying that she is the one who should be having some sense of guilt, the protagonist receives a new mission. The mission insists that she should be uprooting the potato, making her wonder if there was surely such a comment in her previous life. Realizing that she couldn't miss out on winning some rewards, the protagonist starts looking forward to the mission, sensing that she should only care about earning more coins from now on. Clady keeps on calling her out. At that moment, the protagonist suddenly starts rising her voice against her, making her feel the worst fear possible as she has never thought that someone like the protagonist would be raising her voice against her. It seems that the protagonist has taken the power of the soda bombing female leads, and she starts reaching a whole new level of mocking Clady, finding no words to attack the young, 
lady. Clady claims that her father has been nice to her because he is full of pity for her, making her realize that she is quite jealous of her dresses. Clay goes on to claim that according to her father, she is the person who would take someone's kindness for granted, seemingly possible that she still doesn't get what her father said. Halty even warns her that the duke would be kicking her out of the mansion, and at that moment, the protagonist gets ready to prove her wrong, calling her the small lady of the Tarinka family, remarking that her place is on such a higher level as she is the princess of the Parathon family. The Marquis's daughter starts to grit her teeth and it makes the protagonist take hold of the situation even more. She insists that she should be calling her the princess instead. Instead of listening to her, Clayt brings up the topic of the lady's mother, calling her the child of the adulterine of her shameless mother. Not fearing and being mad at the situation, the protagonist asks if she could take responsibility for the things that she said. It seems that Clady is even ready to use the Tarinka family's honor to bet on her certainty. Realizing that she would be winning the argument, the protagonist releases the curtain revealing that the maids were already planted in the room. Sensing that she would be in an opposing situation, Clady acts as if she is hurt and as the maids come to take care of her, she starts blaming it all on the protagonist. But instead of believing her words, the maids continue to protest whatever she was speaking against the young lady, complaining about the fact that she must be quite arrogant to the princess. As the argument starts to revolve around both group, Clayt's maid even claims that she has arranged a present for her, making the protagonist wonder what it must have been, as she has never received anything other than mistreatment from Clady, maybe even some leftover cookies instead. At that moment, Clady keeps on crying and asking how she could even react like that to her while she has brought her a beautiful dress. While presenting the cheap clothing in front of her, Clady adds that she even caught the lady stealing from her, asking her to be friends once again, adding that she will forgive her for saying such things to her. As Clady begins to brainwash the protagonist once again, the duke presents himself in the room, demanding to know how she could be the one to blame the princess for stealing the dresses, while she is the one who stole her dress in the first place. Clady finds herself in such an uncanny situation she is losing her mind over what to do at this moment, knowing nothing to answer the duke. As the duke enters the room, the protagonist herself is flabbergasted as she couldn't help but wonder if he himself would join their argument. As the scene takes back to an hour ago, it seems that the demeanor of the duke was horrible in the imperial meeting, and his presence alone was continuing to weigh heavily on the participants the whole time. It seems that in the middle of the conversation, while everyone was thinking of relaxing for an hour, a father on the table starts insisting that he will be needing to go back as his daughter demanded that he should buy two pastries on his way home, while the others insisted that he should be staying instead, while he can just assign a delivery man. The man claims that it wouldn't be as wonderful as buying the pastries himself if a delivery man ends up completing the work for her, as he is her father after all. As the man continues to talk about the ways he would continue to impress his daughter, the duke gets on with wondering how the protagonist would be reacting to it, if he took time to buy her something to eat such as chew pastries. Fascinating that he would have to miss out on the kiss from his daughter as the chew pastry shop is already closed. The duke fears the worst as the men around him notice that the duke is irritated by something. They think that the duke must be mad because of the silly things they were discussing. The Viscount begins saying that they must go back to the meeting in an instant. The duke ends up calling for Viscount Teku asking him about the bakery and its location, which starts to get them goosebumps as they fear the worst. Viscount Teku thinks that there is no way the duke is seriously asking about the bakery, as he must have been mad at him for discussing such nonsense on the table. He thinks that the duke must have been threatening him, feeling so frightened by his presence. But instead of being fearful of the situation, the man terrifyingly claims that there is no way he must have been interested in it. While everyone else around them is annoyed for the bullshit he spoke in a cool mind, the duke punches on the table making him realize that he has made a mistake by saying those things. When they are about to begin the meeting once again, the private assistant of the duke comes in to say something to him whisperingly which gets his eyes so big that he ends up leaving the room instead of saying something. The duke gets called from behind by the viscounts and insisting that he needs to leave the meeting urgently. He starts leaving without listening to them. When they continue to brag about working immediately, the duke shuns the man and leaves the room instead of thinking twice about the situation as he shuts the door on the way. The last time when the duke left the room was the time when he heard that the protagonist was cleaning the windows. Also, the main reason for him to be absent from the meeting is that he never wanted the little lady to feel that she is alone in the mansion. But today, the reason he decided to leave such an important meeting is that the lady from the Tarinka ended up coming to see the small lady, 
as if there must be something behind her intentions. While the Duke puts on his horrifying face to face the problem his daughter is seeing in front of her right now, his assistant starts to wonder how come the Duke is always mad when it comes to his daughter being in trouble. On the other hand, the Duke didn't care. Much of the matter that the Marquis was taking advantage of his reputation to get money, by fraud, but when it came to his daughter, he is something else. He realizes that the Duke's family must be something else. In other words, they really do not need to socialize with just anyone around him, which goes all same for all of the heirs of the family. When the Duke ends up hearing the assistant speak his mind loud, the Duke remarks that it is his duty to protect his daughter until he comes of age. As he remarks the same thing once again, the Duke gets annoyed as if the assistant was saying some silly things once in a while. Noticing that the Duke isn't that pleased about the situation, the assistant asks for forgiveness, forcing the Duke to remark that he is still curious about the little lady to a great extent. He goes on to remark that the moment he sees his daughter, his whole body would have small reactions, which feels like the curse of taking advantage of the bloodline to the assistant. The Duke claims that he starts to feel like there is burning inside his chest, as if there were bees buzzing around in his chest. The assistant realizes it quite simply as it must be his love for his daughter while mentioning the honor of the empire while he describes the uncanniest way how he wants to do everything in his grasp for his daughter. The assistant realizes that he must be either a legend or just a stupid father, who will one day realize what kind of symptoms that he is now talking about right now. Flady starts to wonder why the Duke must be finishing his meeting so early, but ends up changing the topic by thinking that jumping into his arms will be changing the matter at hand. Instead of being fascinated by her presence, the Duke asks the maids why they would have let Clade enter the mansion, as if she isn't worthy in the first place. Clady understands that he surely is despising her, as she notices that the Duke already took the protagonist in his arms lovingly. Clady doesn't understand why he would be acting so lovingly with his illegitimate child, thinking that it must be some kind of misunderstanding that it wouldn't even matter in the end. She thinks that the protagonist must have spoken ill about her in front of the Duke, and to divert the situation in her favor, she starts holding his pants, asking if he hates her or not. She doesn't just stop there, she ends up claiming that if he hates her, she would end up forgiving him as he had been cheated. When the Duke is astonished by the word cheating, she adds that she wants to apologize to her cousin, asking if he would be forgiving his daughter for the things that she had done. When she is asked to elaborate on the matter, Clady adds that the protagonist lied to her about her stealing dresses in the first place, making the whole story up. The protagonist continues to feel envy of Clady, and Clady remarks that she understands the matter as she was dying so much for his love that she ended up telling a white lie instead. Hearing about the matter, the protagonist feels sorry for her as she thinks that Clady never got to hear the things that she heard in her life. Instead of supporting the things that Clady said, the Duke starts protesting, demanding to know how dare she is to say those things about his daughter to him. He asks Clady about the dress that he had seen, which makes Clady more nervous than ever. It seems that the dress that she is wearing right now is the one that he bought for the protagonist, so he demands to ask her why she would be the one wearing it right now. The whole endeavor makes the protagonist realize that, the day when she met the Duke, he must not have been full of pity for her, but instead, he was talking about her appearance at the event. The protagonist couldn't help but wonder about the things that are happening in front of her, so she continues to look at the Duke astonishingly. Clay doesn't realize what is happening, so she starts protesting on the matter, demanding otherwise, claiming that her father was the one who bought it on her birthday. Then when it comes to every year Marquis Tarnica surprising his daughter with a new dress on her birthday, it all must have been purchased by the Duke instead. Clady keeps on demanding that it is her dress, and the Duke says otherwise, shaming her father, insisting that the dress that she is wearing was surely bought by him. The word idiot hits her so badly that Clady ends up sitting on the ground shocked, she wasn't, expecting the words to hit her all of a sudden, as if she has angered the silent beast. She adds that everyone including her father called the protagonist an idiot this whole time, which makes the Duke ask her if she has heard any rumors about him. Clady remembers the words mentioning the ruthlessness of the dark blood, as if he is the cruelest person standing in front of her. As he reveals his true face in front of her, she realizes that the description surely fits him. Rumors claim that the Duke doesn't know how to cry, as if he wants to cry he will surely make others shed their blood instead of his own tears. As the Duke stands in front of her, tall and unforgiving, she realizes that the protagonist being held in his arms, and loved must mean that the person is fully taken care of by him. Even though she is on the ground helpless, Clady feels like the love that the protagonist is getting right now. 
persistent in insulting the protagonist so much that she starts calling the protagonist names, adding that she must be an illegitimate child, forcing the Duke to remark that she must be trying to leave this world in such a short time. The Duke tries to calm himself, saying that he is trying his best to tolerate her because of her young age, insisting that he doesn't want her to end like that. Realizing that she has made a grave mistake, Clady asks for forgiveness from the Duke, and the Duke remarks that he would think of keeping her alive then. He immediately forces her to get out of his mansion, and when the situation ends, the protagonist wonders what must have happened as she doesn't have any knowledge of it. Instead of fearing the dark atmosphere, she thinks that the darkness that engulfed the room made her feel sleepy in a peaceful manner. Seems like she doesn't have any knowledge of what went on when the place went pitch black, and the only time she could see the room was when there was a light sparkling at her. While sipping on her teacup, she feels like the Duke is the same as always. Then when the Duke's men enter the room all of a sudden, he demands to know from them how Clady ended up entering his edifice to hurt the one who was never supposed to be hurt. The men in front of him start asking for their death as they ended up making a wrong judgment, as they think that even their death wouldn't be enough for the mistakes they have made. Realizing that her father is doing these for her only, she starts yelling no to his father, so they do not have to die for such a small mistake as the room keeps a silent vibe in it. 